Chapter Seven of Three Contributions to the Theory of Sex. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three Contributions to the Theory of Sex by Sigmund Freud, translated by Abraham Arden Brill, eighteen seventy four to nineteen forty eight. Section Seven the masturbatic sexual manifestations the infantile sexual investigation the sources of infantile sexuality it is a matter of great satisfaction to know that there is nothing further of greater importance to learn about the sexual activity of the child after the impulse of one erogenous zone has become comprehensible to us the most pronounced differences are found in the action necessary for the gratification which consists in sucking for the lip zone and which must be replaced by other muscular actions according to the situation and nature of the other zones the activity of the anal zone like the lip zone the anal zone is through its position adapted to conduct the sexuality to the other functions of the body it should be assumed that the erogenous significance of this region of the body was originally very large through psychoanalysis one finds not without surprise the many transformations that are normally undertaken with the usual excitations emanating from here and that this zone often retains for life a considerable fragment of genital irritability the intestinal catarrhs so frequent during infancy produce intensive irritations in this zone and we often hear it said that intestinal catarrh at this delicate age causes nervousness in later neurotic diseases they exert a definite influence on the symptomatic expression of the neurosis placing at its disposal the whole sum of intestinal disturbances considering the erogenous significance of the anal zone which has been retained at least in transformation one should not laugh at the hemorrhoidal influences to which the old medical literature attached so much weight in the explanation of neurotic states children utilizing the erogenous sensitiveness of the anal zone can be recognized by their holding back of fecal masses until through accumulation there result violent muscular contractions the passage of these masses through the anus is apt to produce a marked irritation of the mucous membrane besides the pain this must produce also a sensation of pleasure one of the surest premonitions of later eccentricity or nervousness is when an infant obstinately refuses to empty his bowel when placed on the chamber by the nurse and reserves this function at its own pleasure it does not concern him that he will soil his bed all he cares for is not to lose the subsidiary pleasure while defecating the educators have again the right inkling when they designate children who withhold these functions as bad the content of the bowel which is an exciting object to the sexually sensitive surface of mucous membrane behaves like the precursor of another organ which does not become active until after the phase of childhood in addition it has other important meanings to the nursling it is evidently treated as an additional part of the body it represents the first donation the disposal of which expresses the pliability while the retention of it can express the spite of the little being towards its environment from the idea of donation he later gains the meaning of the babe which according to one of the infantile sexual theories is acquired through eating and is born through the bowel the retention of fecal masses which is at first intentional in order to utilize them as it were for masturbatic excitation of the anal zone is at least one of the roots of constipation so frequent in neuropaths the whole significance of the anal zone is mirrored in the fact that there are but few neurotics but who have not their special scatologic customs ceremonies etc which they retain with cautious secrecy real masturbatic irritation of the anal zone by means of the fingers 
evoked through either centrally or peripherally supported itching is not at all rare in older children the activity of the genital zone among the erogenous zones of the child's body there is one which certainly does not play the main role and which cannot be the carrier of earliest sexual feeling which however is destined for great things in later life in both male and female it is connected with the voiding of urine penis clitoris and in the former it is enclosed in a sac of mucous membrane probably in order not to miss the irritations caused by the secretions which may arouse the sexual excitement at an early age the sexual activities of this erogenous zone which belongs to the real genitals are the beginning of the later normal sexual life owing to the anatomical position the overflowing of secretions the washing and rubbing of the body and to certain accidental excitements the wandering of intestinal worms in the girl it happens that the pleasurable feeling which these parts of the body are capable of producing makes itself noticeable to the child even during the sucking age and thus awakens desire for its repetition when we review all the actual arrangements and bear in mind that the measures for cleanliness had the same effect as the uncleanliness itself we can then scarcely mistake nature's intention which is to establish the future primacy of these erogenous zones for the sexual activity through the infantile onanism from which hardly an individual escapes the action of removing the stimulus and setting free the gratification consists in a rubbing contiguity with the hand or in a certain previously formed pressure reflex effected by the closure of the thighs the latter procedure seems to be the more primitive and is by far the more common in girls the preference for the hand in boys already indicates what an important part of the male sexual activity will be accomplished in the future by the impulse to mastery bemachtigungstribe it can only help towards clearness if i state that the infantile masturbation should be divided into three phases the first phase belongs to the nursing period the second to the short flourishing period of sexual activity at about the fourth year only the third corresponds to the one which is often considered exclusively as onanism of puberty the infantile onanism seems to disappear after a brief time but it may continue uninterruptedly till puberty and thus represent the first marked deviation from the development desirable for civilized man at some time during childhood after the nursing period the sexual impulse of the genitals reawakens and continues active for some time until it is again suppressed or it may continue without interruption the possible relations are very diverse and can only be elucidated through a more precise analysis of individual cases the details however of this second infantile sexual activity leave behind the profoundest unconscious impressions in the person's memory if the individual remains healthy they determine his character and if he becomes sick after puberty they determine the symptomatology of his neurosis in the latter case it is found that this sexual period is forgotten and the conscious reminiscences pointing to them are displaced i have already mentioned that i would like to connect the normal infantile amnesia with this infantile sexual activity by psychoanalytic investigation it is possible to bring to consciousness the forgotten material and thereby to remove a compulsion which emanates from the unconscious psychic material the return of the infantile masturbation the sexual excitation of the nursing period returns during the designated years of childhood as a centrally determined tickling sensation demanding onanistic gratification or as a pollution-like process which analogous to the pollution of maturity may attain gratification without the aid of any action the latter case is more frequent in girls and in the second half of childhood its determinants are not well understood but it often though not regularly seems to have as a basis 
a period of early active onanism the symptomatology of this sexual manifestation is poor the genital apparatus is still undeveloped and all signs are therefore displayed by the urinary apparatus which is so to say the guardian of the genital apparatus most of the so-called bladder disturbances of this period are of a sexual nature whenever the enuresis nocturna does not represent an epileptic attack it corresponds to a pollution the return of the sexual activity is determined by inner and outer causes which can be conjectured from the formation of the symptoms of neurotic diseases and definitely revealed by psychoanalytic investigations the internal causes will be discussed later the accidental outer causes attain at this time a great and permanent significance as the first outer cause we have the influence of seduction which prematurely treats the child as a sexual object under conditions favoring impressions this teaches the child the gratification of the genital zones and thus usually forces it to repeat this gratification in onanism such influences can come from adults or other children i cannot admit that i overestimated its frequency or its significance in my contributions to the etiology of hysteria though i did not know then that normal individuals may have the same experiences in their childhood and hence placed a higher value on seductions than on the factors found in the sexual constitution and development it is quite obvious that no seduction is necessary to awaken the sexual life of the child that such an awakening may come on spontaneously from inner sources polymorphous perverse disposition it is instructive to know that under the influence of seduction the child may become polymorphous perverse and may be misled into all sorts of transgressions this goes to show that it carries along the adaptation for them in its disposition the formation of such perversions meets but slight resistance because the psychic dams against sexual transgressions such as shame loathing and morality which depend on the age of the child are not yet erected or are only in the process of formation in this respect the child perhaps does not behave differently from the average uncultured woman in whom the same polymorphous perverse disposition exists such a woman may remain sexually normal under usual conditions but under the guidance of a clever seducer she will find pleasure in every perversion and will retain the same as her sexual activity the same polymorphous or infantile disposition fits the prostitute for her professional activity and in the enormous number of prostitutes and of women to whom we must attribute an adaptation for prostitution even if they do not follow this calling it is absolutely impossible not to recognize in their uniform disposition for all perversions the universal and primitive human partial impulses for the rest the influence of seduction does not aid us in unraveling the original relations of the sexual impulse but rather confuses our understanding of the same inasmuch as it prematurely supplies the child with the sexual object at a time when the infantile sexual impulse does not yet evince any desire for it we must admit however that the infantile sexual life though mainly under the control of erogenous zones also shows components in which from the very beginning other persons are regarded as sexual objects among these we have the impulses for looking and showing off and for cruelty which manifest themselves somewhat independently of the erogenous zones and which only later enter into intimate relationship with the sexual life but along with the erogenous sexual activity they are noticeable even in the infantile years as separate and independent strivings the little child is above all shameless and during its early years it evinces definite pleasure in displaying its body and especially its sexual organs a counterpart to this desire which is to be considered as perverse the curiosity to see other persons genitals probably appears first in the later years of childhood when the hindrance of the feeling of shame has already reached a certain development under the influence of seduction the looking perversion may attain great importance for the sexual life of the child still from my investigations of the childhood years of normal and neurotic patients i must conclude 
that the impulse for looking can appear in the child as a spontaneous sexual manifestation small children whose attention has once been directed to their own genitals usually by masturbation are wont to progress in this direction without outside interference and to develop a vivid interest in the genitals of their playmates as the occasion for the gratification of such curiosity is generally afforded during the gratification of both excrementitious needs such children become voyeurs and are zealous spectators at the voiding of urine and feces of others after this tendency has been repressed the curiosity to see the genitals of others one's own or those of the other sex remains as a tormenting desire which in some neurotic cases furnishes the strongest motive power for the formation of symptoms the cruelty component of the sexual impulse develops in the child with still greater independence of those sexual activities which are connected with erogenous zones cruelty is especially near the childish character since the inhibition which restrains the impulse to mastery before it causes pain to others that is the capacity for sympathy develops comparatively late as we know a thorough psychological analysis of this impulse has not as yet been successfully accomplished we may assume that the cruel feelings emanate from the impulse to mastery and appear at a period in the sexual life before the genitals have taken on their later role it then dominates a phase of the sexual life which we shall later describe as the pregenital organization children who are distinguished for evincing especial cruelty to animals and playmates may be justly suspected of intensive and premature sexual activity in the erogenous zones and in a simultaneous prematurity of all sexual impulses the erogenous sexual activity surely seems to be primary the absence of the barrier of sympathy carries with it the danger that the connections between cruelty and the erogenous impulses formed in childhood cannot be broken in later life an erogenous source of the passive impulse for cruelty masochism is found in the painful irritation of the gluteal region which is familiar to all educators since the confessions of j j rousseau this has justly caused them to demand that physical punishment which usually concerns this part of the body should be withheld from all children in whom the libido might be forced into collateral roads by the later demands of cultural education the infantile sexual investigation inquisitiveness at the same time when the sexual life of the child reaches its first bloom from the age of three to the age of five it also evinces the beginning of that activity which is ascribed to the impulse for knowledge and investigation the desire for knowledge can neither be added to the elementary components of the impulses nor can it be altogether subordinated under sexuality its activity corresponds on the one hand to a sublimating mode of acquisition and on the other hand it labors with the energy of the desire for looking its relations to the sexual life however are of particular importance for we have learned from psychoanalysis that the inquisitiveness of children is attracted to the sexual problems unusually early and in an unexpectedly intensive manner indeed it perhaps may first be awakened by the sexual problems the riddle of the sphinx it is not theoretical but practical interests which start the work of the investigation activity in the child the threat to the conditions of his existence through the actual or expected arrival of a new child the fear of the loss in care and love which is connected with this event cause the child to become thoughtful and sagacious corresponding with the history of this awakening the first problem with which it occupies itself is not the question as to the difference between the sexes but the riddle from where do children come in a distorted form which can easily be unravelled this is the same riddle which was given by the theban sphinx the fact of the two sexes is usually first accepted by the child without struggle and hesitation it is quite natural for the male child to presuppose in all persons it knows a genital like his own and to find it impossible to harmonize the lack of it with his conception of others the castration complex 
this conviction is energetically adhered to by the boy and tenaciously defended against the contradictions which soon result and are only given up after severe internal struggles castration complex the substitutive formations of this lost penis of the woman play a great part in the formation of many perversions the assumption of the same male genital in all persons is the first of the remarkable and consequential infantile sexual theories it is of little help to the child when biological science agrees with his preconceptions and recognizes the feminine clitoris as the real substitute for the penis the little girl does not react with similar refusals when she sees the differently formed genital of the boy she is immediately prepared to recognize it and soon becomes envious of the penis this envy reaches its highest point in the consequentially important wish that she also should be a boy birth theories many people can remember distinctly how intensely they interested themselves in the prepubescent period in the question where children came from the anatomical solutions at that time read very differently the children come out of the breast or are cut out of the body or the navel opens itself to let them out outside of analysis one only seldom remembers the investigation corresponding to the early childhood years it had long merged into repression but its results were thoroughly uniform one gets children by eating something special as in the fairy tale and they are born through the bowel like a passage these infantile theories recall the structures in the animal kingdom especially do they recall the cloaca of the types which stand lower than the mammals sadistic conception of the sexual act if children of so delicate an age become spectators of the sexual act between grown-ups for which an occasion is furnished by the conviction of the grown-ups that little children cannot understand anything sexual they cannot help conceiving the sexual act as a kind of maltreating or overpowering that is it impresses them in a sadistic sense psychoanalysis also teaches us that such an early childhood impression contributes much to the disposition for a later sadistic displacement of the sexual aim besides this children also occupy themselves with the problem of what the sexual act consists in or as they grasp it of what marriage consists and seek the solution of the mystery mostly in an association to which the functions of urination and defecation give occasion the typical failure of the infantile sexual investigation it can be stated in general about the infantile sexual theories that they are reproductions of the child's own sexual constitution and that despite their grotesque mistakes they evince more understanding of the sexual processes than is credited to their creators children also perceive the pregnancy of the mother and know how to interpret it correctly the stork fable is very often related before auditors who confront it with a deep but mostly mute suspicion but as two elements remain unknown to the infantile sexual investigation namely the role of the propagating semen and the female genital opening precisely the same points in which the infantile organization is still backward the effort of the infantile investigator regularly remains fruitless and ends in a renunciation which, which not infrequently leaves a lasting injury to the desire for knowledge the sexual investigation of these early childhood years is always conducted alone it signifies the first step towards independent orientation in the world and causes a marked estrangement between the child and the persons of his environment who formerly enjoyed its full confidence the phases of development of the sexual organization as characteristics of the infantile sexuality we have hitherto emphasized the fact that it is essentially autoerotic it finds its object in its own body and that its individual partial impulses which on the whole are unconnected and independent of one another are striving for the acquisition of pleasure the end of this development forms the so-called normal sexual life of the adult in which the acquisition of pleasure has been put into the service of the function of propagation and the partial impulses under the primacy of one single erogenous zone have formed a firm organization for the attainment of the sexual aim in a strange sexual object pregenital organizations the study with the help of psychoanalysis of the inhibitions and disturbances in this course of development now permits us to recognize additions and primary stages 
of such organization of the partial impulses which likewise furnish a sort of sexual regime these phases of the sexual organization normally will pass over smoothly and will only be recognizable by slight indications only in pathological cases do they become active and discernible to coarse observation organizations of the sexual life in which the genital zones have not yet assumed the dominating role we would call the pregenital phase so far we have become acquainted with two of them which recall reversions to early animal states one of the first of such pregenital sexual organizations is the oral or if we wish the cannibalistic here the sexual activity is not yet separated from the taking of nourishment and the contrasts within the same not yet differentiated the object of the one activity is also that of the other the sexual aim consists in the incorporating into one's own body of the object it is the prototype of that which later plays such an important psychic role as identification as a remnant of this fictitious phase of organization forced on us by pathology we can consider thumb-sucking here the sexual activity became separated from the nourishment activity and the strange object was given up in favor of one from his own body a second pregenital phase is the sadistic anal organization here the contrasts which run through the whole sexual life are already developed but cannot yet be designated as masculine and feminine but must be called active and passive the activity is supplied by the musculature of the body through the mastery impulse the erogenous mucous membrane of the bowel manifests itself above all as an organ with a passive sexual aim for both strivings there are objects present which however do not merge together besides them there are other partial impulses which are active in an autoerotic manner the sexual polarity and the strange object can thus already be demonstrated in this phase the organization and subordination under the function of propagation are still lacking ambivalence this form of the sexual organization could be retained throughout life and continue to draw to itself a large part of the sexual activity the prevalence of sadism and the role of the cloaca of the anal zone stamps it with an exquisitely archaic impression as another characteristic belonging to it we can mention the fact that the contrasting pair of impulses are developed in almost the same manner a behavior which was designated by bleuler with the happy name of ambivalence the assumption of the pregenital organizations of the sexual life is based on the analysis of the neuroses and hardly deserves any consideration without a knowledge of the same we may expect that continued analytic efforts will furnish us with still more disclosures concerning the structure and development of the normal sexual function to complete the picture of the infantile sexual life one must add that frequently or regularly an object selection takes place even in childhood which is as characteristic as the one we have represented for the phase of development of puberty this object selection proceeds in such a manner that all the sexual strivings proceed in the direction of one person in whom they wish to attain their aim this is then the nearest approach to the definitive formation of the sexual life after puberty that is possible in childhood it differs from the latter only in the fact that the collection of the partial impulses and their subordination to the primacy of the genitals is very imperfectly or not at all accomplished in childhood the establishment of this primacy in the service of propagation is therefore the last phase through which the sexual organization passes the two periods of object selection that the object selection takes place in two periods or in two shifts can be spoken of as a typical occurrence the first shift has its origin between the age of three and five years and is brought to a stop or to retrogression by the latency period it is characterized by the infantile nature of its sexual aims the second shift starts with puberty and determines the definitive formation of the sexual life the fact of the double object selection which is essentially due to the effect of the latency period becomes most significant for the disturbance of this terminal state the results of the infantile object selection reach into the later period they are either preserved as such or are even refreshed at the time of puberty 
but due to the development of the repression which takes place between the two phases they turn out as unutilizable the sexual aims have become softened and now represent what we can designate as the tender streams of the sexual life only psychoanalytic investigation can demonstrate that behind this tenderness such as honoring and esteeming there is concealed the old sexual strivings of the infantile partial impulses which have now become useless the object selection of the pubescent period must renounce the infantile objects and begin anew as a sensuous stream the fact that the two streams do not meet often enough has as a result that one of the ideals of the sexual life namely the union of all desires in one object cannot be attained the sources of the infantile sexuality in our effort to follow up the origins of the sexual impulse we have thus far found that the sexual excitement originates a as an imitation of a gratification which has been experienced in conjunction with other organic processes b through the appropriate peripheral stimulation of erogenous zones c as an expression of some impulse like the looking and cruelty impulses the origin of which we do not yet fully understand the psychoanalytic investigation of later life which leads back to childhood and the contemporary observation of the child itself cooperate to reveal to us still other regularly flowing sources of the sexual excitement the observation of childhood has the disadvantage of treating easily misunderstood material while psychoanalysis is made difficult by the fact that it can reach its objects and conclusions only by great detours still the united efforts of both methods achieve a sufficient degree of positive understanding in investigating the erogenous zones we have already found that these skin regions merely show the special exaggeration of a form of sensitiveness which is to a certain degree found over the whole surface of the skin it will therefore not surprise us to learn that certain forms of general sensitiveness in the skin can be ascribed to very distinct erogenous action among these we will above all mention the temperature sensitiveness this will perhaps prepare us for the understanding of the therapeutic effects of warm baths mechanical excitation we must moreover describe here the production of sexual excitation by means of rhythmic mechanical shaking of the body there are three kinds of exciting influences those acting on the sensory apparatus of the vestibular nerves those acting on the skin and those acting on the deep parts such as the muscles and joints the sexual excitation produced by these influences seems to be of a pleasurable nature it is worth emphasizing that for some time we shall continue to use indiscriminately the term sexual excitement and gratification leaving the search for an explanation of the terms to a later time and that the pleasure is produced by mechanical stimulation is proved by the fact that children are so fond of play involving passive motion like swinging or flying in the air and repeatedly demand its repetition as we know rocking is regularly used in putting restless children to sleep the shaking sensation experienced in wagons and railroad trains exerts such a fascinating influence on older children that all boys at least at one time in their lives want to become conductors and drivers they are wont to ascribe to railroad activities an extraordinary and mysterious interest and during the age of fantastic activity shortly before puberty they utilize these as a nucleus for exquisite sexual symbolism the desire to connect railroad traveling with sexuality apparently originates from the pleasurable character of the sensation of motion when the repression later sets in and changes so many of the childish likes into their opposites these same persons as adolescents and adults then react to the rocking and rolling with nausea and become terribly exhausted by a railroad journey or they show a tendency to attacks of anxiety during the journey and by becoming obsessed with railroad phobia they protect themselves against a repetition of the painful experiences this also fits in with the not as yet understood fact that the concurrence of fear with mechanical shaking produces the severest hysterical forms of traumatic neurosis it may at least be assumed that inasmuch as even a slight intensity 
of these influences becomes a source of sexual excitement the action of an excessive amount of the same will produce a profound disorder in the sexual mechanism muscular activity it is well known that the child has need for strong muscular activity from the gratification of which it draws extraordinary pleasure whether this pleasure has anything to do with sexuality whether it includes in itself sexual satisfaction or can be the occasion of sexual excitement all this may be refuted by critical consideration which will probably be directed also to the position taken above that the pleasure in the sensation of passive movement are of sexual character or that they are sexually exciting the fact remains however that a number of persons report that they experience the first signs of excitement in their genitals during fighting or wrestling with playmates in which situation besides the general muscular exertion there is an intensive contact with the opponent's skin which also becomes effective the desire for muscular contest with a definite person like the desire for word contest in later years is a good sign that the object selection has been directed toward this person was sick leibt das neck sick in the promotion of sexual excitement through muscular activity we might recognize one of the sources of the sadistic impulse the infantile connection between fighting and sexual excitement acts in many persons as a determinant for the future preferred course of their sexual impulse affective processes the other sources of sexual excitement in the child are open to less doubt through contemporary observations as well as through later investigations it is easy to ascertain that all more intensive affective processes even excitements of a terrifying nature encroach upon sexuality this can at all events furnish us with a contribution to the understanding of the pathogenic action of such emotions in the school child fear of a coming examination or exertion expended in the solution of a difficult task can become significant for the breaking through of sexual manifestations as well as for his relations to the school inasmuch as under such excitements a sensation often occurs urging him to touch the genitals or leading to a pollution-like process with all its disagreeable consequences the behavior of children at school which is so often mysterious to the teacher ought surely to be considered in relation with their germinating sexuality the sexually exciting influence of some painful effects such as fear shuddering and horror is felt by a great many people throughout life and readily explains why so many seek opportunities to experience such sensations provided that certain accessory circumstances as under imaginary circumstances in reading or in the theatre suppress the earnestness of the painful feeling if we might assume that the same erogenous action also reaches the intensive painful feelings especially if the pain be toned down or held at a distance by a subsidiary determination this relation would then contain the main roots of the masochistic sadistic impulse into the manifold composition of which we are gaining a gradual insight intellectual work finally it is evident that mental application or the concentration of attention on an intellectual accomplishment will result especially often in youthful persons but in older persons as well in a simultaneous sexual excitement which may be looked upon as the only justified basis for the otherwise so doubtful etiology of nervous disturbances from mental overwork if we now in conclusion review the evidences and indications of the sources of the infantile sexual excitement which have been reported neither completely nor exhaustively we may lay down the following general laws as suggested or established it seems to be provided in the most generous manner that the process of sexual excitement the nature of which certainly remains quite mysterious to us should be set in motion the factor making this provision in a more or less direct way is the excitation of the sensible surfaces of the skin and sensory organs while the most immediate exciting influences are exerted on certain parts which are designated as erogenous zones the criterion in all these sources of sexual excitement is really the quality of the stimuli though the factor of intensity in pain is not entirely unimportant but in addition to this there are arrangements in the organism which induce sexual excitement as a subsidiary action in a large number of inner processes as soon as the intensity of these processes 
has risen above certain quantitative limits what we have designated as the partial impulses of sexuality are either directly derived from these inner sources of sexual excitation or composed of contributions from such sources and from erogenous zones it is possible that nothing of any considerable significance occurs in the organism that does not contribute its components to the excitement of the sexual impulse it seems to me at present impossible to shed more light and certainty on these general propositions and for this i hold two factors responsible first the novelty of this manner of investigation and secondly the fact that the nature of the sexual excitement is entirely unfamiliar to us nevertheless i will not forbear speaking about two points which promise to open wide prospects in the future diverse sexual constitutions a we have considered above the possibility of establishing the manifold character of congenital sexual constitutions through the diverse formation of the erogenous zones we may now attempt to do the same in dealing with the indirect sources of sexual excitement we may assume that although these different sources furnish contributions in all individuals they are not all equally strong in all persons and that a further contribution to the differentiation of the diverse sexual constitution will be found in the preferred developments of the individual sources of sexual excitement the paths of opposite influences b since we are now dropping the figurative manner of expression hitherto employed by which we spoke of sources of sexual excitement we may now assume that all the connecting ways leading from other functions to sexuality must also be passable in the reverse direction for example if the lip zone the common possession of both functions is responsible for the fact that the sexual gratification originates during the taking of nourishment the same factor offers also an explanation for the disturbances in the taking of nourishment if the erogenous functions of the common zone are disturbed as soon as we know that concentration of attention may produce sexual excitement it is quite natural to assume that acting on the same path but in a contrary direction the state of sexual excitement will be able to influence the availability of the voluntary attention a good part of the systematology of the neuroses which i trace to disturbance of sexual processes manifests itself in disturbances of the other non-sexual bodily functions and this hitherto incomprehensible action becomes less mysterious if it only represents the counterpart of the influences controlling the production of the sexual excitement however the same paths through which sexual disturbances encroach upon the other functions of the body must in health be supposed to serve another important function it must be through these paths that the attraction of the sexual motive powers to other than sexual aims the sublimation of sexuality is accomplished we must conclude with the admission that very little is definitely known concerning the paths beyond the fact that they exist and that they are probably passable in both directions end of section seven